The Man in the Attic. I'm Jason Horton. I'm Rebecca Lieb. And this is Ghost Town. On October 17, 1941, 73-year-old Philip Peters was found dead in his bedroom, a quaint home in the Highland District of Denver, Colorado. Near his body was a walking stick, broken in half, the butt of a pistol, and a stove shaker. Upon investigation, police reported that these items were used to bludgeon Peters at least 30 times. But that's only the beginning of the strange murder of Philip Peters by Edward Conies, the man who would be known from then on, in life and in legend, as the Denver Spider-Man. I went to see his house up close, and I'll be intercutting my experience of the house with the history of Theodore Coney's. Here are my first impressions of the place. It's September 28th. I'm in the Potter Highlands District, a historic area of Denver, Colorado. The sky is overcast. The trees are changing. The neighborhood is really quiet. There's a blue house that I'm standing in front of. It has a very pointed roof. It doesn't look, well much different than any of the other homes around here. It doesn't have as much detailing. It's got kind of a a shingled wooden roof and a bright royal blue with white trim around it. There seems to be somebody inside. This is 3335 Montcrief Avenue, the home of the Denver Spider-Man. Theodore Edward Conies was raised by a family of Canadian immigrants. After his father died, Conies moved to Denver with his mother. His health was always bad, so much so that he was not expected to live past his 18th birthday. This created a strange mental space for Coney's. He didn't finish high school, was gaunt and tall, and lived every day like it was his last, in a not-so-great way. Coney's was sick and homeless most of his adult life, mistreated by the public because of his sickly, gaunt appearance. He roamed the Denver Highlands area, intermittently working, finding temporary living situations, and trying to survive, his health worsening and worsening. Philip Peters was almost... Coney's opposite. Peters was in good shape, friendly, dependable, and well-respected in Denver society. He worked for Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad for 40 years until his retirement in 1930, where he lived with his wife, Helen, and had a close relationship with his son and daughter-in-law, who lived about 250 miles away. He was social. He even played in a local mandolin band after his retirement. The one thing Peters and Coney's did have in common, aside from their pluralistic last names, was that both had money problems. Though Peters was financially independent, all of his money was going to his wife Helen's care. She had been hospitalized for two weeks before with a broken hip. Coney's was particularly hard up, desperate for food and shelter. On a walk by his home one evening in September of 1941, the 78-year-old Peters ran into Coney's, who was then 59. While Peters thought it was just coincidence, it was not. Coney's was tailing Peters and asked him for money. Peters, off-put but knowing he couldn't help, politely declined and kept walking. Peters went on with his walk. Coney's walked up the drive, broke into Peters' house, and stole food and money. But before he left, Coney's discovered a small trapdoor in the ceiling of a closet that led to a narrow attic cubbyhole. So he decided to just go up there and live in the attic. For approximately five weeks, Coney's remained in the attic, coming downstairs to grab shit when he needed it, living undetected in the house. Here's my impression of the house up close. Okay, I'm about to cross the street. I'm going to get a little bit closer. I'm not going to bother anyone. I'm a little bit scared. I feel like all the neighbors know each other here, but I need to see this house up close. The roof is huge, and we're talking about when Coney's lived here. It must have been so intimate. Like, you're kind of right up in the space of the house, and it's a one-story house, so it's like roof and then house. You can hear the wind chimes. And there is a neighbor, so I can't stay too long here. On October 17th, 1941, Coney's believed Peters was out visiting his wife in the hospital, so he snuck into the kitchen. In what would be anyone's worst fucking nightmare, Peters awakened from a nap and walked to the fridge for a snack. There, he discovered Coney's at the refrigerator. Peters struck Coney's with a cane he carried, but Coney's clubbed him with an old pistol he had found in the house. After the gun broke apart, Coney's continued to beat him with a heavy iron stove shaker, killing him. Coney's then returned to the attic via cubbyhole. Let's take a break. Peters was murdered and discovered about an hour later by his neighbors after he didn't show up for a dinner. The Denver police were called. 
They searched the house, but the doors and windows were locked, and they found no evidence of a murder, let alone a break-in. Eerily, the police did notice the trap door, but believed no person could ever fit through it. In April 1942, Peters' wife, Helen, came back to 3335 Montcrief Avenue and hired a live-in housekeeper. Both women would often hear strange sounds in the house, and it got so bad that the housekeeper eventually resigned, convinced the house was haunted. Helen Peters eventually moved to western Colorado to live with her son, and the house was considered vacant. Of course, the neighbors would see lights go on and off, and once in a while, they would attempt to knock on the door just to see if someone was inside. Of course, Coney's was inside. He stayed in the house undetected as police continued to make routine checks. On July 30th, 1942, during one of these routine checks, an officer faintly heard a lock click on the second floor. Running upstairs, the police caught sight of Coney's legs as he was going through the trap door to the attic. They pulled him down. He was arrested and quickly confessed to Peters' murder. Of course, media loved it. Local newspapers dubbed him the Denver Spider-Man of Montcrief Place. After the Denver police chief said, quote, a man would have to be a spider to stand it long up there. Coney's was tried and convicted, then sentenced to life imprisonment at the Colorado State Penitentiary, where he died on May 16, 1967. Of course, now this murder is the stuff of Denver legend, especially around Halloween. It has gotten conflated, blown up. It's in media. It was referenced in CSI and The Simpsons, to name a few. And as you heard in the clips, it's not much to look at, the house itself. But that's what Denver's dark history is about. You know, a cute, nondescript house on a historical block holding some pretty weird, dark, and terrifying secrets.